Yoohoo Entrepreneurs, and welcome to the Possibility Partners TV show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, your Chief Possibility Officer, and I love helping and serving startups and early stage entrepreneurs in launching, branding, building their business without spending a fortune or wasting a lot of time. And every Tuesday right here in Google Plus, you're going to find me hanging out at 1 p.m. with the most amazing entrepreneurs sharing what I like to call Andy-licious advice for entrepreneurial adventurers. And these are conversations with seasoned entrepreneurs who are all sharing their best tips, tools, and advice to help you and your business grow and thrive. And you know how much courage it takes and tenacity and resilience and persistence to grow our businesses, right? So this is a great space for us to hold our hands and encourage each other and learn from each other because it really does take a village to raise a business. <laughs> anyway, today we have an extraordinary guest to share their dose of entrepreneurial wisdom and it's the social media specialist Hugh Briss and I met Hugh years ago on Facebook and I tell you he is my go-to guy. Hey Hugh, say hello to everybody for me. Hey Andy, how are you doing? Uh, I'm great, how's it you going? Your intro. <laughs> I mean, you didn't stumble. You didn't say "ah" uh, once. Oh, you know? I don't know how you do that. Listen, see, like, who wouldn't want to work with someone like Hugh? And he gives you such lovely feedback like that. Thank you, Hugh. Where are you hailing from today? Orlando, Florida. Awesome. Well, we have folks from around the world. We have Kansas. We have South Australia. We have the UK. All over the place. So, live viewers, it's so great to see you. Thank you for tuning in and commenting. So today, we're going to be talking about Facebook for small businesses. But first, as you know, I always love to find out how did my guest get their start in the entrepreneurial adventure? I mean, some people, as you know, they come out and they've got some business plan by the time they're four. But some of us, it's a life experience. Sometimes we get pushed into it. We evolve. So let's find out from Hugh. How did you get started on your entrepreneurial journey, Hugh? I think I'm probably going to go with the evolve path. path. Uh, you know, I didn't start out thinking about being an entrepreneur. I, I studied psychology in college. I made, minored in art and photography pretty much planned on working for somebody in probably all my life. You know, entrepreneurship never really came into my head. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, you start out on the path and, and you're... You, by the time I finished college, I knew I didn't want to be a psychologist. So that <laughs> that didn't work out the way it had intended when I first started going to school. Uh, then, so I started, veered over to the art side of things. Um, like, like photography, or yeah, did, do you know how to draw? I was painting. I um, I, I did a project out at SeaWorld one time. This was a long time ago. There's a place it's called Places of Learning out there, and they had a one-acre map of the United States on uh, the ground, and kids could walk all over and find their hometown and everything. Uh, I painted that. I, I was with you know I had a crew, but um, so I was doing all art-related stuff. Paint, but you know the typical art stuff doesn't pay a lot. Um, you know, photography is okay, but that's a hassle. I got tired of schlepping cameras and equipment around all over, taking wedding pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I ended up at some point working for a publisher, then an advertising agency. I decided I liked the graphic design part, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit better than the art part at that point. Um, so I guess the entrepreneur thing sort of that happened back when the Mac first came out. Desktop publishing was getting popular. We had a project we were working on. Um, I had to teach myself how to use PageMaker on a Mac to get the project done. And um, you know, then I started playing around with it. I thought it was pretty cool. And at some point, I decided it didn't make a lot of sense for me to be making an hourly wage while the company I was working for made the big bucks. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're charging the clients thousands of dollars, <laughs> and the designer, <laughs> you know, we're getting paid by the hour. So. Um, in 1987, I started my own design firm, and wow. companies wow. evolved along the way. You know, yeah. Since but, then, but you went you went into design because you clearly. I mean, did everybody see uh, Hugh's fancy schmancy overlay here? I mean, come on, wow! 
But what was it about design and art and creating graphics like this that you that you love? And especially, you know, here's the thing about Hugh guys. He loves to dive in. He's not going to watch some video and have somebody show him how to do something. He's actually the one who picks up the manual and reads it and figures it out without any cliff notes and then brings his smarty pants brilliance to us. But what was it that, you know, the technology clearly spoke to you as well as the design? How did you transition that into a business? Um, you know, the design part is it, you're still being artistic. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, I, but I just like the technology too, mm -hmm. and you know I can create art in Photoshop, and and yeah. um, you can create stuff nowadays that almost looks like you painted it with a brush. But um, so I, I think the combination of art, I like to write, um, mm -hmm. you know. So I've been writing mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah. Uh, that combined with all the different things just sort of makes a nice package, I think. It uh, does. And social media is. Oh. You know, where were it's you? a great way to communicate, and it all goes together. So, where were you when social media hit, and how soon were you involved in social media? Pretty early. Um, like what's early? A uh, Twitter page when I in '95, I think. Um, what? Wait, 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 wait. Twitter has been around since '95. Was it '95 or '96 or 2005? 2005. 2005. 2005. Yeah. I can't believe I wouldn't have been at the bar sooner. <laughs> I mean, Twitter. It's I was just trying to throw you off. <sighs> yeah, I guess um, you know it was after it had started. I wasn't in on the ground floor, but um, I was, and and that's kind of when the whole social media graphic design stuff mm -hmm. started because we could add backgrounds to Twitter, and most people were putting their pictures back there, you know. Right. right and there. I just thought it seemed like a perfect spot. Well, especially once businesses started using Twitter, it just seemed like there's some real estate there mm -hmm. for you know some marketing message or, or some branding or something. And uh, so I I did some for um, people like Guy Kawasaki and Chris Brogan early on. And um, how, Hugh, how did you get such uh, celebrities early on like that? I mean, other than your charming personality. <laughs> uh, I'd known well, yeah. Let's see, I'd known a few of them. Um, just from Twitter, mm -hmm. and then when I came up with the idea of doing the custom backgrounds that were branded, um, I emailed. I think Guy was the first one I emailed, mm -hmm. and I said, "Hey, you want a free background?" And he said, "Yeah, sure." Uh, and at that time, he had been to Russia and had a, a picture of himself taken at a, um, or he had taken a picture at a Russian magazine store. Mm -hmm. So all the magazines were on the racks, and he was a big hockey fan. So I took uh, I took a Russian hockey magazine. I put his picture on it, and then I put the <laughs> magazine in the rack, and that became his background. And it was sort of like an Easter egg, you know. People would people would see his background. They'd go, "What's all this Russian magazine stuff?" And then all of a sudden, they go, "Wait a minute, that, that looks like guy on that magazine." Uh, <laughs> and uh, so and I, Chris, I contacted him and a, a few other people, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I just offered to do it for free, and I figured if they don't like it, don't use it. It's not costing you anything. Um, right, so and hello, out. folks, a great piece of advice there. And what Hugh just did and, and told us about offering something really cool for free. I mean, yes, he's brilliantly talented with a great sense of humor, but still, think about that for your business. What could you offer someone who has a high profile and to do for free? It doesn't cost them anything, and they don't actually ever have to use it, but it's a great way to build a relationship. I just thought I'd have that segue, Hugh. Thank okay. you for that. And then you really start finding your foot in every platform, right? I mean, you, you, what was it about Facebook, though, that had you glopping onto that more often than you do your other social media platforms? The evolution was pure luck because Twitter was, I had a company called TwitterImage.com at that point, mm -hmm. and that's all we could customize. You could customize MySpace and I think we all know where that went. <laughs> all the blinking and flashing and animated GIFs that it, it started looking really nasty after a while. Um, but Twitter was an opportunity and then shortly after that Facebook you, you could you know put up timeline covers mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and in the beginning if you remember Facebook was a little weird too. Yeah. You didn't really have a timeline cover, you had a, a banner, vertical banner on the side. So I was designing those, you know, just to mm -hmm. get some branding on the page. 
And it yeah. was nice when they got to the point where they have the big banners. And, and then Google Plus copied Facebook, and pretty soon yeah. now it, there's a few you can't customize too much, Instagram, right. Pinterest, and but for the most part. Um, so it just kind of evolved in the company. You know, I stopped calling it TwitterImage.com, started using SocialIdentities.com, and just sort of so, seemed to be a wider range of... But Hugh, can you tell all your fans how you chose the pseudonym? Hugh Briss. I mean, really, I love that. And how? And it wasn't taken anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're you're uh, outing me now, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> my dad gave me that name. Um, I've kind of you know that was another thing that I've done there since uh, being online. Um, I like the idea of being a real person online. I just didn't mm -hmm. like the idea of uh, I'm. I'm a fairly private person. I'm private about my family. I don't post pictures of my kids. You know, once in a while I get carried away and brag when my daughter does something great. But for the most part, um, you know, I, I just look at the way I use mm -hmm. social media. It's pretty much for business. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, in the beginning, you know, and I know Facebook doesn't like the idea of people not using their real names and stuff, but um, I just kind of like the idea of not having people know right. such personal information and stuff. Uh, and, and the name was, I don't know, I was sitting around one afternoon, I was probably drinking some margaritas or something, and uh, playing. I was playing around with anything that worked with Hugh. And obviously, you know, like Hugh Jardon or something like that, <laughs> probably wasn't business appropriate. So um, I've, <laughs> there were a whole bunch of them I threw out. But, uh, and somehow I ended up with Hugh Briss and obviously the, the Excellent. obvious metaphor. Uh, and the other day it was pretty funny. I've never had anybody. A lot of people don't even notice. Some people will email me and say, "Well, it has a pretty funny name." But the other day, some guy came on LinkedIn and he said, "You definitely need to rebrand your business." You, you, and he gave me the definition of hubris. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the obvious definition is the ego, but to the point where eventually you fail. I know. That's what he, he was trying to point out to me, but anyway. I love that. Well, and I love that you've built such a strong online presence with your knowledge, and folks can continue to have confidence in your ability to provide state-of-the-art advice, direction, graphics, everything. You are always on the forefront, and that takes time, and you and it it takes a lot of building faith and trust in your audience, and what you do really, really well is be consistent in everything you do. Uh, I think it's remarkable, Hugh. Well, thank you. And what a and great... I, that's, uh, that's always something that I worked on, too, was the... Um, and I, I, I see where a lot of people, that's an issue. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we talk all the time about personalizing your brand. Um, you know, Scott Monty with Ford was a good example for years, you know. I mean, well, the idea of liking Ford's page um, and seeing updates from Ford, you know, and some, mm -hmm. you know, you have no idea who it is. You know you're not talking to a company. You're talking to a person at the company, but there's no face attached to it. There's just a logo every time they post something. So, yeah, um, I mean, you know, I thought Ford. Scott, it was pretty cool. He would mm -hmm. talk for Ford. He would talk about the new Mustang that just came out and everything. Um he was handling all their social media, but he became more or less the voice for Ford on social media. Right. Uh, other people that are, you know, Mari Smith, for example, she is her brand, so she can be Mari Smith, the business, and Mari Smith, the person. Um, yeah. Mine, I, you know, I just thought trying to run a company called Hugh mm -hmm. Briss didn't make a lot of sense, so it had to have a company name. Right. But right. along the way, I, I've, I've just spent a lot of time making sure that my personal brand and my business brand more or less combine into one. And right. you know, because of the fact that I don't do social personally, mm -hmm. I leave it up to my wife and my daughters to run our personal <laughs> Facebook pages. So you know, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it as a, a so much as a person as somebody that's talking to their friends and family. I'm doing it right. as a person that represents the company. And and of course, this is a perfect segue into how to manage your Facebook life as a business owner, as a solopreneur, as you know, a small business entrepreneur. 
But first, I just want to say hello to everybody who's watching live. Thank you for tuning in. You guys are amazing. We have Robin. We have Dave. We have William. We have Mia. We have, um, hold on, who else is there? Mel Mel's here. Dave, James, uh, Karen, Johan, Janice. Uh, gosh, amazing. Thank you. Thank this you. This is the romper room section. <laughs> this is the romper room. <laughs> I see so <laughs> and and I just want to remind everybody that at the end of the broadcast, I will provide a link so that you can come into the green room, the behind the scenes with you and me. We'd love to see you and have a great, delicious conversation. But now onto Facebook, because of course here on Google Plus, we banter a lot back and forth about Facebook. But the bottom line is the big brands get. Facebook, they know why they're using that using this platform, and I'm sure even with some of the constraints that they've recently put in you, that this is a wonderful place and space for the small business owner, provided we can stay on top of the changes and make this platform work for us and help us reach our target audience. So where do we begin as someone who's building a presence on Facebook? Um. I would never tell somebody to only build a presence on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it should be part of, I would, Twitter doesn't necessarily work for every brand, mm -hmm. um, but probably Twitter should be in the mix for most brands. Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Obviously, LinkedIn works better for B2B type businesses, not so much for the consumers uh, side of things. But, um, so, and I think, too, that if you have more than one, you can talk to your customers, your clients, a little bit differently depending on the platform they're on. Some platforms lend themselves a little bit better to more of a formal approach. Some of them you can be a little bit funnier, maybe uh, have a little more fun. Um, right. And then, you know, if, you, if you're going to take the, the conversation of comparing Facebook and Google+, which a lot of people do you know I don't like Facebook I only like Google Plus or whatever mm -hmm. um, you know I, I don't really understand the argument because it's not important per, what I personally prefer it's important what my clients and my customers prefer and I think I need to be in at least both of those places um, I think you know Google you got a lot of early adopters that ran over there and and a lot of the techie types and it hasn't managed to attract the general population they're still pretty much ensconced over on Facebook so um, you know I think you're probably talking to two different groups of people not necessarily the same people in both places which yeah. is a good thing mm -hmm. uh, I think if, if you get talking about organic reach that's obviously the big uh, you know the big buzzword right now in Facebook mm -hmm. uh, and the the thing I wonder about is how many of those people actually thought or expected that they should be able to run a business and market a business for free um, you know so they're all saying oh it's pay to play now they tricked us you know we got a lot of fans and now we can't talk to those fans unless we pay uh, you know, and then it, I think it depends on how you're talking too. If it's a commercial message, I I think you really should expect. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Well, you know uh, what happened here though is when we when we, those of us who were on Facebook two, three, four, five years ago, wow, you could have a blast as a business owner on Facebook and really create a buzz, and you had all these wonderful engagement numbers, etc. But then you know the funnel got tighter and the experience got tighter, right? Yeah, and the same thing happened on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I was first on Twitter, I would post or tweet something. Uh, it would get retweeted hundreds of times, sometimes thousands of times. But, you know, at that time, we didn't have as many followers, and there weren't as many people. Now they're up to 300 million or whatever they claim. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so obviously the more people there are, the noisier the stream's going to get. And mm -hmm. when the stream starts getting noisy... Um, you know, at this point, Facebook is trying to find a way to keep it appropriate for their um, users. Yeah. So, so, if you want something in the feed uh, organically, you're going to have to make sure that it's really good content. And I think that's uh, one of the things that a lot of people probably they're used to. The time you were talking about, if mm -hmm. you posted it 
something and everybody saw it and talked about it. Uh, we we got to refine, you know, what we're doing now. Right. They are adding in some new things. Also, I, I would think one thing everybody should understand is that if you go look at your insights, analytics, whatever they want to call it, depending on the platform you're using, and you compare Twitter, Google Plus, and Facebook, Facebook, even though the organic reach has dropped considerably, it's still, for the most part, higher than the engagement that you're getting on the other platforms if you're comparing apples to apples and you actually look at your insights. On Google Plus, you have to have a business page to see the insights, but right. I think a lot of people, if they go look, they're going to be pretty surprised to find out that they're not really talking to as many people as they think they are. Yeah, um, but um, but I found this on on Facebook, Google Plus page, you know, wherever you're having a page, I think getting engagement is a lot more challenging than on your profile. And uh, for me, I was like you, and I set up my Facebook profile. I came in as Andy Lyons, and I no family members, no <laughs> nothing about my personal life going on. It was all business. And then I set up my page, and uh, and my page, you know, grew and grew and grew for years. It was wonderful, but there's a different engagement practice. And I know a lot of solopreneurs are constantly asking, "Do I need a Facebook page?" in order to be successful and reach my target audience on Facebook. What do you say to that? Well, are you saying do they need a Facebook page if they want to just say advertise on Facebook? Well, there's that. that's a great question too. That, those well, are my because, two big questions. Right, yep. So you, you, a lot of people at this point would start questioning it. They would mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to spend two hours a day uh, curating content, writing my own content, uh, taking the time to engage with the people that engage with my content, keep a discussion going if one starts. So you put a lot of time and effort into running a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're going to say, well, the organic reach has dropped to the point now where that is all just now a waste of time, why don't I just buy, buy an ad? Um, why don't I just pay for the post if I'm going to have to pay for it anyway and just stop wasting time? I'll just go buy ads on Facebook. Um, I think the thing that a lot of people have to understand is that the f if you have fans who already you already know they like your product, they like your your brand, they like your personality, whatever, you're going to be a lot more successful if you're advertising or paying to reach those people than you are if you're just paying to reach a general audience that you pick based on maybe interests or whatever. So, okay. yes, I think it's important to have a Facebook page. And I think it's still important to nurture the fans that do engage, even if even if it's only two or three percent of your fans. If you have a thousand fans and you're still getting, you know, twenty or thirty of them on a regular basis engaging, you think, wow, that's I'm not talking to very many people. The thing is, you know, the the one quote that I have on my social pages is that uh, the power of social media is not in selling directly, it's in inspiring and motivating others to do right. it for you. So right. I think rather than me being the one to spread the message, I would like to build a group of evangelists and advocates who are willing to do it for me. So even though you may not be reaching thousands of people when you post something on Facebook, as long as you're still reaching your core Group right. of people and keeping them happy and finding ways to show appreciation when mm -hmm. they do share your content. Right. The other thing you have to look at too is if you actually go look at the on Facebook your number where it shows the reach for a post. If you click on that and open the box that shows you what the actual reach is specifically, how many shares, how many likes, um, how many comments, it also shows you how many of those you got on shares of your content. So a lot of people don't realize that their reach is actually a lot higher than what it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you see a reach on a post of 500, if you click it, you'll see that actually a lot more than 500 people saw it because your reach doesn't show you how many people saw it based on the shares that somebody else shared. I, I love that. I absolutely love that. And it's the ultimate organic reach, which is nurturing those few folks who you are engaging with, they will share you. 
and they will spread the word about you and your work. Now, for a page on Facebook, let's talk about how we share because, you know, initially I was trained that you share just a written word maybe three times, like a little piece of content three times, then maybe a link or me, or then we went through a period, oh, you must always show a picture, you know, use an image when you post. Are we back to, I mean, where are we now on Facebook? We're actually back to being more frequent. visual. Being more visual. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, we, the, there was a period where if you posted a picture or a video or a graphic, uh, that post would usually get a higher reach than if it was just a text or a link. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what happened was Facebook started seeing that there was a lot of gratuitous images showing up. Every time, if we were going to write a short post, uh, you know, a sentence or two, it didn't really need a picture because you were just offering a quick tip. Mm -hmm. Then uh, if we thought that, wow, if I stick an image in here, it's going to do even better, uh, people were finding ways to stick images in that didn't really need to be there in the first place. Sooner or later, it started looking almost like, uh, you know, Instagram or Pinterest or something where as you're scrolling, it's nothing but, but pictures and a lot of memes, you know, mm -hmm. started getting popular. Yeah. So I think maybe they adjusted the algorithm to cut back on um, how many of those gratuitous pictures that didn't make any sense were in people's feeds. Yeah. Uh, at that time, which was probably a year ago now, um, text-only posts were killing it. I mean, they were they had the more reach than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, link posts were usually typically at the bottom if you left the link preview in there. So then we started recommending put the link, leave the link, remove the preview. Those yeah. typically got more uh, a higher reach too, yeah. uh, but now that they've started cracking down on the memes and and keeping those out of the way, I've noticed that we're swinging back now. My text only posts are starting to get maybe a little bit less reach than the mm -hmm. ones that actually have a graphic. Videos are still are now a video post is probably always going to be at the top reach wise. If you upload the video yourself, if mm -hmm. you if you share a YouTube video, if you take a YouTube video link and post it or if you share it directly from YouTube the reach is not going to be good but if you actually upload the video to Facebook the reach is a lot higher than yeah. anything else if you post images anything more than two um, Facebook loves it you know people you gotta remember Facebook loves Facebook Instagram is a Facebook product if you post something on Instagram and share it onto Facebook it's going to do way better than if you just post the picture directly on Facebook. Now, uh, but how many times? How many times a day should we be posting? Because that, to me, I I think that can because well, we know the people who will post ten in a row and then we won't see them for the rest of the day. I mean, this is why they have scheduled <laughs> posts, folks. <laughs> but um, what is your barometer check for that? As far as how often you should be posting in order to reach your folks while they're on on Facebook. Um, and that's a, one quick point, too, about the uh, scheduling. It's starting to look like scheduled posts are getting whacked. Um, a lot of my posts lately that I've scheduled, the reach has been really low, and I, you know, it doesn't really make sense to me, but it looks almost like they're penalizing us. The only thing I can think of is maybe they're thinking too many of us are planning ahead. So we're going to post five times a day. We don't take the time to actually do it personally. It's also not topical. They're, that's big now. They're telling you what topics are interesting. Uh, they want us to be talking about the current events. If you're scheduling posts, they know right up front that what you're talking about is not current, right? right. I mean, right. If, if, you, if you could have posted it at 8 a.m. this morning, but you think, well, i got to wait till 2 p.m. this afternoon, well, now it's you know what six hours old at that point. So maybe Facebook is starting to cut back a little bit on the reach yeah. for scheduled posts. I don't know. But as far as how often a day, I've always done it real seat of pants. Um, if you know if I run across something that is a current event, obviously I'm going to do it right now. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to schedule it. Um, and then as far as how often. I try to do it probably not more than every three hours, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, but I don't really sit there and figure, okay, every three hours, four times a day, you know, yeah. I, I don't really do it that way. 
Uh, a, I also seem to. I, mm -hmm. I saw Mari the other day say that um, she's noticed that by posting less frequently, she's getting uh, better reach and engagement on her posts. And there might be something to that. Um, yeah. You know, for people that are, you know, I think two or three times a day is is fine. The yeah. ones that are posting ten times a day, if you, if you're noticing that your organic reach is really dropping, you might want to try twice a day and see what yeah. happens. Yeah. This is why I follow you, Hugh, on Facebook. And, you know, folks, you can go to a page as well as a profile and click the button that says, you know, get, give me a notification. I, you know, I, I have to be on Facebook to remember exactly how that works. But I just make sure that no matter when Social Identities posts or Hugh posts, I get noticed because this is how I stay up on what's going on on Facebook and all the different changes. So, Hugh, let's... let's um, Look at some of these great questions here. Okay, so if, Alan has a great one. Question: Andy Lines and Hugh Briss, what about the news that Facebook is dropping the ability to provide promotional links? Hmm. I think what he's referring to is their announcement that it's not so much that they're dropping promotional links; it's that they're going to penalize promotional posts. Uh, I haven't figured out how they plan to do that. You, you, they have an algorithm that looks at things, you know. It, it's looking for certain words. That's how they're finding memes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so obviously, if if your phrase has "lol cats" in it, you, it's probably gonna they're gonna assume it's a meme. Uh, if you're promoting, you might wor use the words like "buy now," "shop," uh, "sale." You know, any words that would you would use that you would think would tr trigger a computer algorithm to think that must be a promotional post. Are they actually going to penalize us if we use those words in a non-promotional post? If if you posted something and said, "Hey, I'm having a big sale for Black Friday," well, obviously it's a promotional post. But I could use the word "sale" in a sentence that has no promotion intended. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not quite sure how they plan to do that. They say they're going to start penalizing promotional posts. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll have to wait and see how that happens because I don't think it. Yeah, it's and funny. I'm just going to say, stay tuned, Alan, and again, follow Hugh, get involved in what he has on Facebook, so much free advice constantly. So here's a great question from Scott. Scott Silverstein says, I would love to see a real example of someone on Facebook enlisting their fans to do the work. Ooh, I have to right. say in my old business, Bring Back Desire, people shared and had sent their friends over all the time, but what yeah. do you think, Hugh? Red Bull is a great example. Um, you know, Red Bull has built the huge fanatical base of fans, you know, and, and they kind of use the surfboard, um, uh, cyclocross, and all those activity sports. And they mm -hmm. had that guy jump out of space, they, you know, so they do all that stuff. But they're constantly asking their fans to submit pictures of them doing things. Um, the, the fans like it. You know, personally, I don't like the taste of Red Bull, so I'm not going to be a big fan of Red Bull, but a lot of people like it. The ones that like it are, you know, they're going to tell all their friends about it. And I think, um, you know, I I think, uh, you know, most of the brands that are, oh, Oreos, another good example. You know, they're posting funny pictures during the Super Bowl when the blackout happened. They had that, you know, within a matter of minutes, they had that. Cute little picture of said you could even you could still dunk your Oreo in the dark. Uh, <laughs> people are sharing tons of that stuff, and Oreo is, you know, I think doing a great yeah. job of getting their fans to sell the stuff for them. Is you know, right. Oreo itself, sure they're still paying money to advertise and stuff, but I think yeah, right and, now, and I know a lot of it comes from the fans. Yeah, and I know in our neck of the woods, Dunkin' Donuts does a great job. And folks, I know we're we're tiny. We're like dots compared to those large brands, but I'm a few a huge believer that we can scale down what the larger brands are doing and do that with our own customers. Can we be as creative and clever? I don't know. That could be some of our own personal challenges and in, in coming up with these ideas. But we can what we like to refer to as tweak and take or take and tweak. See what someone else is doing, tweak it for your business and use it. Um Nazim has a Google Plus question. Question for our host. What is your opinion of the Hangout tool in Google Plus for business promotion? Uh, I think it's a great tool. Um, 
and I, you know, um, Andy's a perfect example of using Hangouts for business promotion. So, um, I think if you can come up with a topic that people want to talk about, then a Hangouts. You've got uh, who, who I can't think of her name right now, but there's a musician that more or less became popular because of Hangouts. Right. She's been singing, doing her concerts right on Google Hangouts, and she has thousands of people actually watching live and then of course watching later on YouTube mm -hmm. so you know she started from nowhere and is a big hit now almost exclusively because of a Google Hangouts I saw a show she did the other day where she was explaining her whole setup how they you know they, how they run things through the mixers and get it to sound good and and so they all the instruments sound correct and everything but um, you're you know you're seeing quite a few musicians now starting to use Hangouts to do live performances right. and things. Right. Great question. Thanks. And then I'd like to bring in William Rock here. Any platform equals time and engagement and what is your why? Oh yeah, that's absolutely true for any business, William. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's important that we remember that it's about engagement and not just to post it out to the world and just let it hang there. If someone likes it or says something, come back and chat with them. You know, Hugh, I know for me personally when I started on all social media, which was in June of 2011, I felt very but it was just really hard for me to loosen up and get into the whole engagement of social media language. I mean, I find that there's a language, although I, you know, and, and I know you bring a lot of humor to your work, yet you still keep that professional, courteous edge. What is your advice for communicating on social media, period? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I think you pretty well covered it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, you got to be who you are, and unless it's not appropriate, but um, right. You know, I I think you need to be a real person. Mm-hmm. And and um, there's one quick thing I wanted to bring up about mm -hmm. Facebook, and it probably applies everywhere. But I think a a trap a lot of us fall into is that we build a core audience. Um, that audience sometimes isn't necessarily your best client base or your group of customers. So when you post something on Facebook, if you've built up um, several thousand fans on Facebook, especially like my case, people that follow me on Facebook are expecting tips and and talking about social media talking about social media graphics and things like that so they followed me for that purpose if I was to advertise to those people I'm probably wasting my time you know those are people that are wanting to do it themselves so they're following me to find out should I use PNG or JPG should I use you know what what pixel size should my images be uh, all the kind of stuff that I'm talking about I've managed to build a group uh, on Facebook, I have two Facebook groups. Same thing. Most of those people, e even and if they are clients, at one point they may have bought something from me. I don't know that they're necessarily going to keep buying from me. So if I was to go on Facebook and spend money and advertise to my fans, I think I'd, you know, in a lot of mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, be wasting money. If so, I think it's important to understand your customer base and it's all it's it's a lot broader than your fan base right it absolutely is and by the way did we ever answer the question about can you advertise if you don't have a business page on Facebook well you can you can okay uh, yeah anybody can go buy an ad and mm -hmm. the, the you can buy ads so in other words you can buy a sidebar ad it, the most effective ads tend to be sponsored stories so they look like a post the only right. difference is it says sponsored at the top of it but anybody can buy those and you don't need a page to do it but the point I was making at that time was mm -hmm. if you go in and pay money to put a sponsored story in there and all the people that are seeing it haven't already associated with you in some way it's not as effective as if somebody that already likes you and likes your page sees it. Right. So I think it's important to have a page um, if if you want right. your ads to be effective. 
Absolutely. A um, couple other I, things too, real quick. Oh, good. On share, share. Facebook, on Facebook, um, they just added a call to action button, so it hasn't. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it yet. They say it's going to take about a few weeks to roll out to everybody. Um, so now, next to the like button, to the left of the like button, we're going to have a spot to put a call to action button. On our you've pages. Got, yeah, in the mm -hmm. timeline cover. So you've got about ten choices: shop now, buy now, learn more, watch. If it's a video, uh, contact us, and they're actually letting us link off-site directly from our Facebook page with that call to action button, uh, and that's something I've talked about to people a lot: is to use your Facebook cover as a call to action because you know we know that people don't necessarily come back to our pages a lot, but at some point they probably come there at least once. While they're there, you know, you want to do as good a job as possible of you know, hooking them in some way. If right. you have, um, you know, I don't know, if you have a free webinar coming up or if you have a sale coming up for the holidays, anything like that. Now with this new call to action button, it you can actually put a button there that says shop now. So if your timeline cover has, you know, a cool graphic and the, uh, whatever that product happens to be and it has some text in there that creates a call to action, 50% off for Christmas, uh, you got that buy now button on there before you had to get to people to click your banner mm -hmm. and then in the description you'd have a link and you mm -hmm. could get them there. I, I used to put click here click here for more information and things like that to entice somebody to click mm -hmm. my banner because a lot of people don't know you can do that but now there's going to be an actual button there. Um, I think I it's huge. That. I'm really surprised Facebook's willing to send people away from Facebook because theoretically as soon as they land on your timeline and they see your timeline cover and maybe you're an author and you've got a new book out um, and in your timeline cover you've got a picture of the cover and it says hey check out my new book and right below that is an actual button it's not something you put there it's something Facebook put there and it says it says buy now uh, they click that you can send them to Amazon you know or or your website or wherever you want. That's a tremendous feature and folks if you need to upgrade your timeline please go visit social identities.com. Hugh does the best timelines for all the social media platforms, not just Facebook. But I'm really excited about that call to action for our pages. And Hugh showed me something, folks, that I thought was really cool. On your timeline for your business page, you can create a description. So for you, how does that work, though? And I can do a quick video for that as well, Hugh. But I think we just click on the timeline and there's the opportunity to put a description in there. Yeah, and when you... Um... So you upload your timeline cover, you click on it just like if it was in a, a picture. It opens in the photo viewer just like any other picture. And there's the description spot. If you write something there and you put links there, they're actually clickable. Um, and that's why if you have something that entices somebody to click your timeline cover, even a button that says click here, uh, if they click it, it opens in the photo viewer. On the side in the description, you've got your text about whatever it is you're trying to, to sell them or whatever and an actual link that they can follow. But now you know with this call to action button it makes that even more useful keep in mind too that every time you update update your cover the text that you have with it if you've actually put a description with it shows up in the post um, so when somebody's going through you you see you're going through your news feed and you see that Starbucks updated their cover typically it's just a picture of whatever the cover is but if you took the time to put a description there that text is actually with that cover image becomes a post if there's a link it's clickable right in the description too. I love that. Okay, so Nazim, he's from Italy, uh, or hanging there in Italy. Hi, Nazim. His he has a great question. And on a personal note, Hugh, well, it's not showing up now. It's just me. Oh well, I'm gonna have to read the question, everybody. On a personal level, what is your favorite social media platform, Hugh? Um, personally, Facebook, but. Um, I guess it's just because that's, part, you know, there's a comfort factor to anything. Um, and and um, I don't think there's a lot of competition, too. You know, if you, do, if you like Instagram, for example, I think it's great for somebody that has uh, a visual product mm -hmm. or a visual way to promote their business. You know, for me, I've tried to use it, and um, it's just I'm, I'm more of a B2B business so you know I don't really have some awesome new shoes or jewelry or you know right. 
toys or whatever it happens to be that I can post pictures of people using and mm -hmm. stuff. But for people that you know a visual branding works well you know then Pinterest is, is another good example yeah you know if, if you Wonderful. if your business fits there you mm -hmm. know I just think mine it, LinkedIn I do I like LinkedIn too um, you know a little bit different atmosphere over there but very similar to Facebook mm -hmm. it's just, it tends to be more you know business to business than yeah um, for folks you when we were talking about the singer, and he was mentioning the singer who's really launched an amazing career here. Her name is Daria Musk. I don't know yes. if this is going to come through. No. Oh well. And I don't even know if I'm on which, you know, which thing I'm on here. The comment tracker stopped working. Oh well. But thank you, Dave Pipe and Scott Scowcroft, for providing Daria Musk's name and information. That's so wonderful. Hugh, before I get back to you, some last comments with you. This is when I love to wave and blow kisses to my dear friends and fans who stopped by to say hi and said they were going to watch the replay. Okay, so I'd like to wave and blow kisses to Mwah, Deborah Taylor French, Melinda Moses, Cherie Valentine, Jen Rang, Rain Dowell, Deborah Crosby, Deborah Oakland. Oh, well, Deborah, you ended up showing up, Deborah Crosby. Yay! Uh, Christopher Pearsall, thank you guys for always stopping by and sharing. If I missed anybody, I'm so sorry. Uh, Hugh, any last comments you'd like to make before we end broadcast and start our afterglow party? Hmm. Um, okay, one last comment. I th going back to Facebook and why you know I tend to prefer to like it a lot. Uh, I think another something really important for people to consider is, especially with pages and organic reach and all that, is consider the idea of starting a Facebook group. Uh, I think you know, used in conjunction with a page, it creates a a great community. Um, building source. You got a page that lets you broadcast your messages, but the group gives you a better opportunity to talk directly to the people, carry on conversations. It, it's also um, going back to the question of how do you get your fans to sell stuff for you? That you know, a Facebook page is a, is a or a group is a great opportunity for that. It also gives you a chance to create a community of people like in, in my Facebook group, two, two different groups. Um, if people come in there to ask a question, it doesn't have to be me answering the question all the time because we've got, in one case, 1,800 people that are members of the group. So they all end up talking to each other, helping each other, sharing new ideas with each other. Uh, that you know, marries perfectly with my Facebook page. The, the two just seem to go hand in hand. Uh, so I would highly recommend that... Um, you know, people consider the idea of setting up a group. Yeah, I think they're wonderful. They're great for masterminds. They're great for you know, setting up, especially if they're really close, tight. You know, nobody can get in <laughs> except those who have paid, perhaps, to be in a mastermind group. It's wonderful. And we have that here on Google Plus as well with the community. Uh, thank you, Hugh. You're, uh, you are a social media expert, and I highly encourage everyone to go, go over to socialidentities.com and click on his menu because there's something for you there multiple times. I know for me it was he branded me with Bring Back Desire across all my platforms. It had a beautiful consistent sort of rolling theme and it was wonderful and it really adds a whole other level of professionalism as well as creating more trust and faith uh, in your customers, in you, by having that consistent brand across all your social media platforms. So thanks for joining me today, Hugh. And next Tuesday, that's December 23rd at 1 p.m., it's the Tierra Goddess. Oh, yeah. The social, unbelievable media wonder woman, Mia Voss. She's coming to join me, and we're going to talk about why it takes years to be an overnight success right? <laughs> and other holiday stories, especially when you're reinventing yourself and you're trying another business out for size. It is. It may look easy once you've hit that big, huge success, but everybody knows there's some amazing stories behind how many years you sat down before that happened. And she'll be, uh, we'll be bringing in our holiday festive gear and food and drinks. So, please join us. We would love, love, love to see you for that conversation. Thanks to all the live viewers. You're amazing. I'm so grateful. Replay, folks. Oh, thank
thank you for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. That way you'll always be notified when a new show gets uploaded. For those of you who are going to join me in the Afterglow chat and party, I'll be hitting end broadcast and share the link with you in the comment section. Wave goodbye to everyone, Hugh. Thank you so much for joining me. Really, you're amazing. And you can see that delicious combination that he has of Smarty Pants Tech Guy with brilliant, artistic, and a refined eye for branding. It's a wonderful combination. You don't see it that often. Thanks, everybody, for joining me for another episode of the Possibility Partners TV show. Until next week, I'm wishing you an Andy-licious day. Mwah.